you got to point it down. If otherwise, you wind up look like looking like part of the lollipop guild. <laughs> um, Art, P.S. We are now live. Oh, really? Hey, hi. How are you? See, this is what <laughs> happens when you're not paying attention. This is what happens when you're part of the lollipop guild. Hey, you know what? I get that a lot. <laughs> and not well, incredibly tall, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, hi, Art. Welcome to the Spring Pad Show. Hey, Devin. How are you? <laughs> Um, so today is a very special Spring Pad Show. Um, we're doing, this is Spring Pad Show 6.5. And uh, Art, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what we're talking about today. Well, this is something different. We're going to give this a try. And we had such a good conversation with Andrew in our last session, our show number six, talking about going paperless. And he threw out so many good ideas that you know, Devin and I were kicking this around. And we're like, you know what? This is a great opportunity for us to do some brainstorming. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you an opportunity to see Devin and my brainstorming in action. It, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, they say you don't want to see how a sausage is made. Well, this is kind of it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's the messiness that occurs as we start to kick some of these ideas around. So Devin was good enough to take some notes on Andrew's talk. And we want to try and take some of those things and see how they would fit together in SpringPad and ways to approach them and maybe ways not to do it or throw in other systems. Who knows? Could go anywhere. So. <laughs> Let's find out. Um, go, okay. Go so, yeah, so I was uh, looking back on some of the things that we talked about, and there was one thing that Andrew said towards the end that really stuck out in my mind, and that was the whole concept of redundancy and how you know, there's these two things happening, right? There's this importance of redundancy in your files, in your papers, right? To make sure you have copies of things, whether it's virtually or in print. Um, I'm obviously advocating for the virtual copy, but... Um, and then there's this group of people who overthink the redundancy and have too much of it. They have too many drafts, too many versions of things, and it's cluttering up their space. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting place to start because I think that there are ways that sort of there's lightweight redundancy, um, more about convenience, and then there's like the sort of necessi ne uh, necessary <laughs> redundancy uh, that's more about making sure you have important copies of important documents. Yeah, thinking about that myself when he threw that out there, I, I quickly looked around my desk and I've got portable hard drive, external hard drive sitting here. I've got the drive in my machine. I've got four different cloud accounts. I've got SpringPad. I've got stuff in storage, stuff ever. You know, look up George Carlin's whole routine on stuff and you'll get the idea of how this stuff is spread out redundantly. And it becomes a challenge. How do you know where it's good to put things and where it isn't? Because you have that, if you're like me, you have that nagging paranoia of I could lose it. Or is it the only copy, or, or are there two copies, and there are three copies? And I think you hit on a key point, and it's this idea of necessity. Ranking the importance of the redundancy determines what should go there. Yeah. So if you think about things, the irreplaceable, uh, not only financial documents, I mean, we're heading into tax season, so people, everybody's thinking about that kind of stuff. But the irreplaceable things, uh, family photos, uh, birth certificates, anything like that that's a record that you could need, it makes sense to have a digital copy either stored somewhere in the cloud, have it on a drive that you can take with you. I mean, right here I've got just a puny little flash drive. This, this is what, a 16? No, this is a, yeah, 16 gig flash drive. 16 gig can hold every document I could possibly need. In an emergency, I can grab it and run. The challenge is, in an emergency, am I going to think of it? Yep. Yep. So that's where I think when we think about things like SpringPad, uh, using it from the standpoint of redundancy, I don't know if I would use it for archival purposes. SpringPad to me is something for content that I need to get a hold of again and will likely use in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, you know, something within that time period. There's, a, there's an immediacy to the document and to the material. Something like, you know, a copy of my kid's birth certificate. Eh, the odds are pretty good I'm not going to need that tomorrow. That's but true. But I, I may need to be able to see the information that's on it at a later date. So I think we have to find a balance. Well, also, I mean, when you're talking about archiving, it makes me think of um, Janine Adams' uh, Organize Your Family History Notebook. 
Mm. He very much uses it for archiving, but I think more in the active sense where she's actively pursuing uh, her family history and collecting all the data to put it together. And so it's sort of this active project of archiving, right? It's not really necessarily the end state. And I would say also that, you know, I use SpringPad for more than just, you know, I'd say the notebooks at the top are my most immediate actionable notebooks, right? Those are my work project notebook and my task notebook that I use day to day. But then further down is like my recipe notebook that I use a couple times a week, right? Mm -hmm. Or my movie notebook that I use less because I haven't been seeing that many movies lately. Or my book notebook for when it's time to go on vacation. You know, I used it before I went to Mexico last month, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, in December. And I was like, great, I have these sort of lists ready when I'm when I need them, but I don't necessarily need to access them all the time. Right, and that's it's interesting because now that we're kicking this around, I'm starting to think about the fact that for the stuff that I archive in SpringPad, I actually have a bunch of notebooks that are kind of like I'm going to show you how old I am. If you think back to the card catalog in the library, <laughs> where you got, you know, back to the Dewey Decimal, I was so proud. I used to be really good at that thing. But if you think about that, that was really the index to all the archives of content in the library. Well, that that's one of the things that I use SpringPad for a great deal. I won't take originals of things and park it in SpringPad, but I'll use SpringPad to tell me where those things are. Yeah. Um, great example of it. Daniel Gold did a post a while ago talking about using QR codes for organization and where he had storage boxes in his attic and he actually puts QR codes on the outside of the boxes and then uses that to look up what the inventory of that box is. Now he was talking about it with another system but I've done the same thing using SpringPad because all it is is the URL off of the note. Yep. So you can inventory things and put them in storage, know that you can find them when you need them. Yeah without having to go through the effort of actually turning everything into digital content. I think that's the, maybe it's just me, but that's the inertia piece that keeps me from going down that path. When I look at the quantity of stuff, I'm like, I could spend weeks just turning this into digital content. To what purpose? I mean, right. Do I really need it to be that accessible? No, and for a lot of that stuff, you don't. I mean, I think that's sort of the point that even Andrew was making, like, you know, there are certain things that are always going to be physical. They're never going to, you know, mm -hmm. you're never going to make your boxes digital, right? Even with that cool hack that Daniel came up with. I love that hack. It's so cool, and it's a great way to catalog things. But, you know, that stuff's always going to be analog, right? And so it's just sort of thinking about, what it what about making things paper making your life paperless makes your life easier and the answer is a lot you know i mean being able to have your desk with you everywhere you go is so convenient i mean we, when we talk about redundancy redundancy to me is in a certain extent is having access to it everywhere right or having one document one note mm -hmm. one movie one recipe and being able to put it in multiple notebooks that to me is redundancy and true convenient redundancy. Yeah, that is a big thing to be able to have that. When we talk about redundancy, we confuse it often with duplication versus accessibility. And what I think what you're talking about is the accessibility side of the equation. Yeah. I mean, something just like I've fielded this question in the community a couple of times. You know, I put all this stuff in the spring pad. How do I make sure it's going to be protected because it's out there in the cloud? Well, one of the things you can do is you can go into the help system and do an export. You can dump all the content you put in there out as a big HTML file. Take that, dump it out, throw it on a flash drive, and there's your protective redundancy because you can't lose the content. Then. It's The formatting may change, but the content's still there. I mean, if you look at a lot of people in the productivity space who are the text aficionados who live off of text files, it's the same thing. That's basically all it is, just more functionality and more capability. Yeah. And but I think it's important I, to a lot of people nowadays, that backup, you know, just having that ability. And, like, you know, just the safety of knowing that there is one. Oh, absolutely. And that's the kind of thing that I actually use in reverse process because, for example, uh, the... The spring hack I shared last show talking about 
uh, taking things and turning them into actionable items inside a spring pad? Well, I do that for two reasons. One, because it makes it easy to follow up. But secondarily, when I send that information over through IFTTT, I get a copy of the email content. So it's redundant. If I goof up and manage to delete that email, I still have the content. I mean, I can recover it out of trash or I can pull it out of spring pack. I've got multiple copies when I need it. And when I don't need it, I give myself the right to discard. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing that I got out of Andrews, and a couple of them too, when we were talking to Peter as well, that giving yourself permission to get rid of stuff. Yeah, that's I think it, important. It's huge. We turn into digital pack rats. And you look at the, all the different systems that are out there, some of them lend themselves to you becoming a digital pack rat. Spring pad, I don't think, does that because honestly, with its being so visually oriented, if you're cramming too much stuff in there, it looks like it. You've got pages and pages and pages of springs, and you've got dozens of notebooks. And you, every time I look at mine, I go, man, how did I get so many springs in here? And I realize I've been cutting and pasting and mailing and everything. So you take a few minutes and you do that house cleaning and reshuffle things where they're supposed to be. In other systems I've used, I never had an interest to do that because I always would cheat myself. I would say, well, if I can't find it and I didn't tag it and I didn't put a notebook, I'll just search for it. Should we, um, we might talk about that for a second, you know, because there are so many different ways to save things. And I think that people mm -hmm. sometimes either like don't remember that they're available or maybe don't even know about them in the first place. But there's a bunch of different things. Like you mentioned email in. That's sort of secretly one of our like most popular features because it's so convenient. And it's literally a custom email um, that you can grab from settings where you can forward anything in your email to SpringPad. Um, and you can even, in some cases, change. Uh, you can take an email and make it a type in SpringPad, like yeah. mail an event um, or a task. Um, that's a, one of our coolest features, I think. There's a couple of blog posts that talk about the different formats that you can put in there, the text pieces, for example, something simple. Like if you put task colon in the subject line, it creates a task spring when the email shows up, which to me is, that's just cool right there. I mean, you, you're determining type by content. But to me, it, I do a lot of work outside for CourseWorks, and CourseWorks, our systems, we get a lot of business customers who live in that email space. They want to receive notifications. They want to get notifications back. They live off of their portable devices and say, ah, okay, I don't know how to use this thing, but I know how to send email. Well, that's exactly it. To be able to forward the email into the system and just know it's there yeah, and then be able to process it later can be a big step for a lot of people, and it gives them... You know, depending on what methodologies you follow. If you're a big fan of Inbox Zero, well, <laughs> guess what? Stuff doesn't have to live in your inbox. I mean, That's there's, true. There's so many posts out there to talk about don't use your inbox like a filing cabinet. Well, that's exactly what this is. Don't use it as a filing cabinet. Go through and actually get stuff organized and put it in the spots where it's supposed to be. Well, also, the second you're using your email as a task manager, like, your life is over, right? It's never going to, like, it's a nightmare. You know, most of us get too many emails in a day to use it as a task manager. So finding emails and forwarding them into SpringPad, into your work notebook, where you can prioritize a little bit better without all the mm -hmm. clutter, I think just makes it a lot easier. Also, I mean, my other thing that I love using that I use all the time on my phone, too, and this is another thing that we don't talk about a lot that I love is, so we have the web clipper, right? The little button that you can put in your browser on your computer to um, help you save recipes from websites or books or movies or whatever. That is so convenient and I love using I use that web clipper all the time. But what's even cooler is I use the Chrome browser on my iPhone, okay? Mm -hmm. And there was, we published this blog post forever ago. There's a way that if you just type in, you can add the button uh, to your Chrome browser on your phone too. So all you have to do is type in the word spring it and it pulls up the clipper and it just makes it so much easier. It's so cool and I love this feature and it's so secret. Like I think that blog post was published a year and a half ago and it's like, it's a little, like, it's not the easiest thing to set up. It's not the hardest either. It's a, it takes a little bit of like, but the post really outlines how to do it. And so now, anytime I'm on my phone, and most of us are on our phones more than we are computers these days, so like I'm sitting on the bus on the way to work, 
and I see a cool recipe that I got, I use that all the time, and literally I just type spring it in my in the browser bar, and it pulls up the clipper. It's so cool. Yeah, it's. I'm on the flip side of the equation because I was a iPhone user for a while, and I moved over to Android, and I live off the Android share function because it gives you so many different things that you can share with. Yeah. And two of the things that I like is, one, the way you named it, add to SpringPad means it shows up at the top of the list every time, which is great. Or, <laughs> that or wasn't on purpose. No, but it works. It it's, makes it so easy to just capture and move on and capture and move on. It's similar to things like Pocket where you're just grabbing content and putting it in there. But then you can go back later and start to leverage. I've actually been kind of plowing through a bunch of sci-fi books as of late. And as I find listings and recommendations, it's going right into SpringPad for later on that when I finish one book, I can go see what are the next ones I want to go grab and, yeah. build it and move that through. Because, again, when we think about this going paperless, it could be you know a checklist somewhere. It could be a post-it note someplace else. But it doesn't mean that you're going to have it available to you when you're ready to work with it. And I think that's the thing that most people forget about this paperless process is it has to give you a, an extension of convenience. This stuff now has to be relevant to when you're ready for it, not you being ready for wherever it is. Yeah. So, you know, if I want to go through my reading list, I don't want to have to sit down at my desk and flip through it. Now, if you take, you know, the Moleskine fans of the world or the journal fans of the world, and I trust me, I love my, my analog media. There's nothing that says you can't just take a picture of it. I mean, that's one of the things I've been doing lately is a bunch of productivity tips on index cards. And it's so funny how people how yeah, how people have locked into it. But the funny thing is, is since I started that, I have now misplaced all five of those cards somewhere. Uh, no idea what I did. They with, are. I have no idea what I did with the originals, but I still have the digital ones, and that's really what it matters because those I can share. I can pass this information around, and I think that's one of the things we have to remember about paperless: is once it's virtual, you can now do pretty much whatever you'd like with it. It's yeah. not just digital filing cabinets; it's turning it into a more interactive media. If you think about things. My daughter just got engaged this past weekend. Congratulations! Yay! So one of the things she's going through is this whole plan. You know, planning has now started in full swing. It's a long time off, but I think I'm going to be living this for quite a while. Plan her wedding in spring pad. Yeah, well, that's one of the things is I'm starting to go through and, you know, capture this and grab that and drop this into this notebook. And I know when it comes to time to share that with people, I can. The flexibility is there to be able to go and, and make the decisions and put the checklist in place and make sure this person gets this check and, and this person has gotten this order. and Great. It'll be organized. Yep. And I know that no matter where I am, if I'm sitting at a basketball game or if I'm working here, I can pull it up and say, yep, that's what was going on. So that's the benefit of paperless is that it now can follow me around. Yeah, and so be you ready don't have to worry for about remembering it. You know, I have to. Okay, so I have to make a confession. I'm probably gonna be fired for this, but I actually have a physical notebook, and I, I don't know how I started using it. It was one of those ones that was given to me as some kind of promotional thing, and one day I pulled it out, and I don't remember why, and I would start to jot things down in it. They weren't mm -hmm. necessarily my lists because I use SpringPad for that, um, but I just. It was like a crutch. I don't know. I don't know how it started, and I wrote some information down on it one day, and this was recently. And um, I left the office, and I worked from home the next day, and I didn't have the the stuff that was on that in that notebook because I leave it at work, and mm -hmm. I needed it, and I was. I think it was during one of the snowstorms actually, and I remember kicking myself like right. This is why I don't use notebooks. <laughs> and again, journals, like I've been journaling my whole life. I love them. And I don't think there's anything wrong with using paper notebooks. I think everyone has their own process and they should and do what works for you. But it was one of those moments where I realized, like, yes, this is, this, it's not following me around. I have to remember it. And I don't remember anything. Speaking of that, when you think about having like a journal or a book like that, do you have that sense of anxiety of where is it? 
right now, you're constantly looking to make sure that you haven't left it somewhere. Yeah. Because you know you're not going to get back what's in it. I mean, if it's gone, it's gone for good. And I'm a big paper fiend. I mean, I mentioned that during the, the show with Andrew. I sit there, because I do all my creative work on paper. If I'm coming up with ideas for a procedure, uh, when I'm building something for coursework, so I go through and I lay out the business process, and I'll lay out the process. Well, eventually, it's going to wind up in Word and Visio and, and being built out in our solutions, and that's great. But that initial process, I need that tangible aspect. The problem is if that process takes more than 10 minutes, I may get interrupted. So do I risk that disappearing? No, I grab my phone, take a quick snap of it as a spring pad photo note, and then move on. Yeah. I still have the paper. If it disappears, I've got at least something to reference it by. Now, what's interesting with that is I hear a lot of people, and Andrew talked about it as well, talking about p turning things into PDFs and storing them that way. And One of the things I hear a lot is that they say, oh, yeah, load it into systems that OCR the documents, so then you can search in the contents of the documents. I'll admit, I'm going to climb up in my soapbox here for a minute. <laughs> Properly tagged content should never need to be searched. And All I, right, that's I will, a big statement. <laughs> I, I know it's a big statement, and it's a very profound statement, and I, I am proven wrong many a time, but I still stand by it, because if you are going through the effort to organize information and the things that you need and tagging it properly... 95% of the time, and I have nothing to substantiate that number, but 95% of the time what you're searching for in there could be a tag. And that's really what it comes down to. When you think about things like when I'm looking for customer information, what am I searching on? I'm searching on the name of the customer or maybe the account executive who worked on it. Things that make logical sense as tags. So if I'm moving from paper to virtual, Taking that time to define that tagging index, and that's one of the things that SpringPad is so good at, is giving you that multiple level of tags. Not just the tags themselves, but the notebooks, which are kind of like Uber tags in many cases. That combination is huge. Yeah. Because yeah. now you've got that flexibility. Plus the search. I mean, you make a couple of good points. First, I sort of agree with you. Um, because when I'm searching my email for past emails and I need to find in there, I'm usually only searching by a person's name, mm -hmm. you know, their first or last name, depending on who it is, and one keyword, right? Those could easily be tags. Um, or, you know, if it's a document, you know, you might have like two or three keywords, whatever. But the point is, right, it's very easy to index things. And I think that people more and more are getting used to tags. They don't see them as complicated. They see them as what they are, which is just a really simple way to help you catalog things. Um, it's another way of naming something without putting it in the title, you know? Um, but that aside, search is still really powerful. And our search is, I think that, you know, our search is really great because you can search for something that's not even tagged and we'll still find it mm -hmm. in the item. And the way we have it sorted on the search and do page uh, makes it even easier to find what you're looking for. And I've used it a lot. Um, and I really, it's a way to almost take away the necessity of cataloging, even though I don't really believe in not doing that. Mm -hmm. I still think it's great that you have that option where it's like, I just can't, I just need to find it. I just need to find it. And you now, just type in two words, and there it is. I will confess that even though I stood up on that snow box and made that statement, this past weekend when it was time to make my guacamole dip <laughs> and I couldn't find the recipe, I searched on avocado. So, Because I knew I did not have a tag for avocado. <laughs> but there is that balance to maintain. And so many people, when they think about going paperless, they think they have to go to one extreme or the other. And that's not the case. All of these different things, as long as you put some planning into it and some thinking about what do you, how do you need to get to the information, you can put together this structure to make it really efficient and really effective. The yeah. whole tagging thing, I'll go back to our email conversation. That's a great example of how powerful tags can be. I mean, you think about effective systems. Uh, one of the things that Peter Allen talks about is that whole touch it one time. You know, either you know, do it and act on it and move on. Don't keep fiddling with it. Well, if you think about sending emails in the spring pad, 
if you're going to create a follow-up task for a particular customer that deals with a particular product, you know, something out of my case story, I can take an email, forward it to the SpringPad, with task at the beginning of the subject line, ampersand and the cusp customer name to drop it in that customer's notebook, and the pound sign and the actual product, that's the tag, or multiple tags. Now I don't even have to think about, did it go in the right spot? Because as soon as it gets into SpringPad, it's going to process that, and it's going to go into the right notebook, it's going to have the right tags attached to it, and it's going to be a task item. Yep. And now I've made that process easy. I'm going to get super nerdy here for a second, but the way I think about tags is tabs in a binder. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to sort, I mean, it's more than just, you know, you've got that list when you click on the search box that sort of comes down if you want to select it. But if you sort your notebook by tag, Mm -hmm. and you tag things. For me, it's it, for me. I like tags more as tabs, um, sort like in each uh, tab of a notebook because it makes it. I realize that sounds confusing, but for me, it's about how I view things. Mm -hmm. I'm viewing so many, my job has so many different components to it every day, and so I need to catalog catalog my daily tasks and having that ability to view things by tag sometimes can be really helpful in uh, prioritizing my day and this is just a personal process for me it's not necessarily something that everyone wants to do and I admit it is a little nerdy I'm in spring pad every day I use it all the time I love it it's helpful for me so I'm obviously digging in a little bit further than a lot of people might but it really that for me it's so much more than just having things organized the right way, it's how I visually see them every day. Well, and that's the thing is that if you take time to understand the combination of tagging and notebooks in SpringPad, and you understand how they can interrelate because tags cross multiple notebooks and springs can exist in multiple notebooks, it, it requires a little bit of three-dimensional thinking. But then you start to think about all the things you're going to put in there. For example, let's take you know tax planning this year. You know we've all got all this stuff, and one of the things I habitually do is I'll go through and as I get um, W2s in and 1099s and that sort, I take a picture and I put it into SpringPad. Why? Not for the historical record because honestly, once tax season's done, I pull all that stuff out of there because I don't like that floating around the cloud. But it gives me an opportunity to start to organize it. So when I put it in there, it's tagged with what company is it for and what member of the family is it for and has it been entered into the system yet. So I'm using that to not only manage the paper, but also the process and thinking around it as well. And I think that's where people really need to look at this and say, if I'm going to go from paper to electronic, how deep do I want to go in? Is yeah. it that I just want to be able to get to the stuff when I need to? If so, great. Then set your boundary there to begin with. Get stuff in there. Give it a basic structure. Recall it as you need to. That's fine. The second level, though, is when you say, all right, am I going to make this part of my everyday process? Now I've got paper coming in. How am I going to handle it? How am I going to route it? Does it need to be shared with people? Now I'm taking it to a different level because this truly is becoming productivity in a paperless space. And I think that's when you look at the types of things that Andrew's laying out and some of the others, that's where I think people get stuck. Yeah. Because they can't make that decision. They get into that analysis paralysis of what can I do. And that's the one thing I challenge anybody with SpringPad is that guess what? You don't have to make that decision. Yeah, and also Just like start. It, Yeah. And so much of you know people ask me, you know, a lot if I if I'm out and I'm talking about it with friends or friends of friends, you know, and they say, wow, there's so much you can do. What do I do? Like, they feel confused, and I think, you know, it's, it is what you make of it. Any, or any tool is what you make of it, and you can make it as big and as small as you want. I mean, some people literally just use our app with the, the movie notebook and the book notebook and the restaurant mm -hmm. notebook, for example, and they just make a bunch of collections, and that works for them, and that's all they ever use it for. They're not interested mm -hmm. in tasks. They're not interested in tags. They don't care about certain, like, some people just use it on one device. You know, it's really, mm -hmm. I think it's important to really start with what do you need and what do you want, you know? I actually bumped into a surprising number of people who had no idea there was a website, <laughs> which I thought was hysterical. I'm like, really? 
yeah, I guess you could do that. And it, it is a different kind of mindset. Set your parameters accordingly. Um, one of the things that I found is a great way to get people into using it, especially migrating from paper to virtual, is to focus on the things that are going to involve more than one person. Mm. Uh, when we were talking about it with Andrew, we were talking about those documents that have to be shared. Yes. And now, I got three kids, and with three kids, there's always stuff that has to be shared between my wife and I. And it's a great way to be able to put that stuff in a place where we can both get to it. Now, could you do it with other systems? Sure. No problem. Not saying that this is the only way to do it. I'm saying this is a way to do it, but it also happens to be one that, unlike any other system I've worked with, I've gotten adoption from what I want to say non-technical people. Yeah. People who just want to find a way to make it work. They don't have. They don't want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get it together. They just want it. You know, click a button and have it do something. And that's the kind of thing I think when we start to think about that migration from paper to electronic, get the tool out of the way. Just start doing those basic mechanics and see how it works, and then adapt it as you need to adapt it. But don't be afraid to start. No, that's the that's the fun part. Um, I feel like at some point, and probably not today, because um, we should probably wrap up, but one of the things that occurred to me earlier when we were talking about redundancy, I guess I'm bringing it full circle here, mm -hmm. back to the beginning, was uh, the IFTTT recipes. Um, yeah. The one you shared last week was awesome. There's a ton more on there. from. I think there's more from you. There's some from Daniel. There's a lot of really great IFTTT recipes that I've even tried. Um, that are great for automating the redundancy. You know, mm -hmm. if you take a picture on Instagram, it automatically gets emailed in as a photo to SpringPad. That's one I can remember. Um, and for me, that's important because I do actually have a, a notebook of my photos on SpringPad. Mm -hmm. uh, and they come from various sources, including Instagram. So that was a cool one. Um, but that's a great, um, it's ifttt.com slash SpringPad or something. You just search for SpringPad. There's a whole page of awesome yeah. recipes created yeah, by other people. And I just think it's such a cool way to hack your system. And it's not complicated because other people have created them, so you can just use them. Yeah, you can actually write off, if you're mobile-centric, they've got a really nice mobile interface for their page. So you can just go to it on your web or your mobile browser and set up the rules that way. The important thing with IFTTT, though, is to take the time to learn how SpringPad receives emails. Learn those structures, so the names, the, how to create a note, or how to add it to a notebook, how to add it to a tag, because that's what's going to really make IFTTT work for you. Um, it's easy to have it just forward something over, but because you have like body text that you can edit, uh, you have information that you can provide, then it can become very powerful. I have a recipe that I use that monitors my Twitter account and my Facebook account. And whenever I post something to one of those, it makes a copy of that into a notebook called Journal in SpringPad for me. Now it's like, okay, great, so I have redundancy there. But yeah, I have redundancy. It's very easy for me to go back and look at what I posted a year and a half ago. That's not all that easy to do in Twitter, and it's certainly not all that easy to do at Facebook at times. Oh, definitely So not. when you start to look at that cross-compatibility and where is this going to actually take me, sure, I could try and store all that stuff, but it's not the same. And l allowing the system to provide that work, you start to think about it, and I, I've started to think about SpringPad this way. This is as close to a virtual assistant as I've ever gotten. And I've tried for years. I mean, if you look at my little pile of devices back there, I've been trying for years to get one of those little guys to be a virtual assistant. Some have come close. But never, never has it quite gotten there. And this is one that's finally gotten me to a point of saying, yeah, I need to capture it. I can work with it. I can organize it wherever. It's easy enough to do. And things like the show notebooks that we have here, discussion. I'm working with someone right now just in conversation. She's trying to put together a big social event sometime in October. And I told her right away, first thing, set up a notebook. Because you've got four or five people all over the country who are working on this. You've got to collaborate. Yep. And whether it's big enterprise systems or just small teams, collaboration is key. Keeping everybody communicating and on the same page is key. And this is a great way to do it, especially for our own personal lives, not just the professional side. Well, I feel like this is a high note we should be uh, ending on. This is on. fun. 
We gotta like do this. this more. Yeah, we're gonna do this more. I think one of the things we should put out to the community too, um, for those who are watching, is you know we have toyed around with the idea of doing really shorter shows focused on singular features even. Um, so if you guys have any, if there's features you want us to just talk about, just one feature, um, you can tweet uh, at Art Gelwix, at Devin Emily, at SpringPad. Um, you can comment on this show. You can comment in the SpringPad Springboard community. But we can talk about so many things here, and we do a lot of uh, listening to you to try to figure out what you might be interested in. But uh, the easiest and fastest way is to just tell us, <laughs> and we'll talk about it. Absolutely. So um, just let us know. And uh, should we talk about uh, the next show? Because that's coming up. Sure, go ahead. Um, so it's a week from today. It's mm -hmm. February 11th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We're talking to Daniel Gold, and I'm so excited about this topic. I think it's so relevant, and I actually have a lot to learn because I've been dying to write a book. Um, but this is all about writing, publishing, and selling your own ebook. Um, so as most of you know, Daniel has written quite a few ebooks himself, and he's been extremely successful. And so he said about writing an ebook about writing an ebook. And it's, uh, it's got a lot of great stuff in there. What I like about his book is that he's really soup to nuts in it. He gives specific tools to use, specific websites and resources. It's not just this sort of um, idea book. It's mm -hmm. very specific tools, um, pieces of advice, things that he's learned that can really help you actually do it. feels real, a lot like a guide in addition to inspiration. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about it. I think he's got a lot of good stuff to share. Yeah, Dan Daniel's one of those guys that if you're thinking about doing this and you listen to him, you will be further down the path when you're done listening to him. You will have good tactical knowledge to be able to execute on, which I think is lacking in so many places. So. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think, and actually, he did create a spring pad notebook that he's going to share with the people who watch this. There we go. With some of his tools in it, so this is going to be. I'm I'm excited. I'm not going to lie. This is going to be. There we go. And maybe by the end of it, I'll be writing my own ebook. Hey, I I'm working on mine. It's yeah. slow, but it's getting there. Little Finally. bits at a time. <laughs> and, and this is the other thing I'd like to throw out to anybody watching: if you have a spring pad notebook that you've made public, that you think other people would benefit from, might be interested in, might be like. Let Devin and I know. We'd love to see it. We'll share it out. We'll take a look at it. And that's, I think, one of the most underused aspects of SpringPad and probably one of its most powerful, and that's the depth of the people using it and all the different ways they're applying it. So if you've got a way you're using it, let us know. We'd love to hear it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for watching. Art, this has been a blast. Let's. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this lots more. So. <laughs> all right, you guys. Have a good day. All right. Take care.